All right, awesome. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank you all for being here today. Welcome to the Avid Edit On Demand Customer Roundtable. Um, and if I am a smaller company uh, or a smaller to mid-sized post company, is the cloud for me? That's what, gonna be the key question that we answer today. Um, and like I said, I wanna thank you all for joining. We really appreciate you all taking the time today. Um, here's the agenda for today. We have uh, webinar goals, which I'll cover very quickly. And then we'll also cover logistics for uh, folks who wanna ask questions throughout the course of the webinar. Um, we'll do some introductions and then we'll uh, get into a round table discussion. I will also just briefly touch on edit on demand and what it is for those who may not be familiar. Just a couple slides, um, just kind of familiarize yourself with the offering. Uh, and then we'll get into questions. Um, in terms of the webinar and at the end of it, what you should uh, hopefully uh, gain from being part of today's webinar is first and foremost, you know, a good understanding of what edit on demand is and its applicability to small and mid-sized production companies and the many benefits it provides, um, which we'll get into uh, with our panel. And then uh, generally speaking, how it's informing uh, future uh, in terms of the decisions, both operationally and economically for uh, those companies. Real quick on logistics, if you're in the Zoom room today and you want to answer uh, rather ask a question, uh, please use the Q&A button um, and go ahead and an uh, answer or rather ask any question you'd like. We will answer those throughout the course of the webinar. Uh, we have Corey Tedro on the phone today. We also have Kent Peterson um, and they are going to be here answering uh, those questions throughout the course of the webinar. So please go ahead and ask away. Um, and then we'll also pick some at the end and uh, ask those on the panel. And then if you're participating on a social channel like LinkedIn or YouTube, Thank you uh, for being part of today's webinar as well. Um, and feel free to ask uh, questions there. And we will also monitor uh, those channels as well. And we'll incorporate those questions uh, into the webinar too. Anything that doesn't get answered in the webinar, uh, we will certainly answer in the Q&A. And then of course, we will publish all of that information and share it with you uh, when we're done. We will also send you the recording. So if you uh, signed up for the webinar and uh, couldn't make it, you will get the recording um, when it's over. All right, let's start. So first and foremost, thank you again. My name is Ray Thompson. I am the Senior Director here at Avid for Partner and in Industry Marketing. And we are very fortunate to have a fantastic panel for you today talking about it on demand. I want to welcome John Alaskas. John, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, I'm John. I'm the founder of Black Spot. We are a medium-sized uh, agency in Soho. Uh, predominantly, we do broadcast promotion and advertising, but we do some longer format uh, projects as well. Um, I started using uh, Evid On Demand uh, this summer uh, during the pandemic and uh, found it to be a fantastic experience. Awesome. Thanks, John. And then we also have Christopher Rash. Chris, go ahead and introduce yourself for the audience, please. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris. I'm a freelance post supervisor. I'm currently working with a, a production company called Sawhorse, um, as well as Luminosity Entertainment. Um, and Luminosity is producing the, the film where we are use, just using Edit On Demand. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Uh, okay, so really quickly, just for those who may not be familiar, who are hearing about Edit On Demand for the first time on the call today, what is Edit On Demand? Uh, Edit On Demand is a turnkey editorial service in the cloud. So it's a software as a service that auto provisions all the things you need in order to run uh, basically Media Composer in the cloud. And uh, so that means you don't have to have any cloud expertise on your staff in order to deploy Edit On Demand. It does all of that for you. Um, and then once it's set up, uh, you're using uh, your familiar and, and favorite editor uh, in uh, in Media Composer. So if you have editors who are used to using Media Composer, there's literally no uptime uh, in terms of learning curve for them at all. They're using what they always are used to using, which is, of course, Media Composer. Um, and they're just accessing that Media Composer through a secure client. Um, in this case, it's Teradici. Um, and then in terms of getting content into Edit On Demand, we're using File Catalyst, which is an accelerated file transfer. that allows you to basically take content uh, that is uh, at potentially a lower bit rate. And then you basically push that up into uh, Edit On Demand. You do your work. Folks can go ahead and edit remotely from anywhere. And then when you're done with the project, you just download the projects and the pins and you bring that back into your on-prem environment where you can do any type of finishing that's needed. Um, the uh, service is uh, the first for Avid, by the way, uh, first SaaS offering from Avid, um, which uh, includes the ability to have up to 30 clients uh, or 30 different editors using the same service at the same time. You can have up to 60 named users in the service and you can basically scale as needed. So in your production, if you start out with just a few editors, 
a smaller amount of storage. And then as the production grows uh, and as more storage and or more editors are needed, you can simply add those throughout the course of the production. The way the service is offered is both on a monthly and weekly basis. And you also get a certain amount of hours per seat. Um, and you also get uh, storage uh, that you buy. And the good news is if for whatever reason you go over that allocation uh, during your use, um, you do not pay any overage fees. You basically just will get a note from uh, an avid uh, customer success rep to let you know that um, you are over and we would recommend that you basically upgrade to a, a bigger uh, package, whether it be more bandwidth storage or compute. Um, and then uh, basically you just go from there. And this includes all the support you need. And of course it includes the other third party tool sets Again, all auto provisioned for you uh, in the cloud in a matter of hours. Um, in terms of just uh, a sort of a high level topology in terms of what it looks like, um, this is a nice diagram that kind of shows you how those deployments are made. You can see the Nexus uh, file system, which has been uh, deployed on the Azure Blob storage stack is sitting in there and that is basically what you're using. So again, you can actually use the same Nexus management console that you're already used to using to manage your on-prem uh, Nexus to manage your cloud based Nexus in edit on demand as well. So that should be a very familiar tool. And again, zero uptime or learning curve for those who are already familiar. Um, and then it's accessible from really any thin client using the Teradici client. Um, I won't reiterate the, the 60 main users and the, and the 30 concurrent users who can use the service at the same time. Um, and then you also have a variety of different workflows, including uh, some third-party plugins like Boris FX, uh, um, which uh, is, is also part of the service. So uh, for many users, uh, what we found is that uh, in many cases, the performance um, that they uh, found using edit on demand has actually been better in some cases than maybe what they have with their system on-prem uh, because the VM that's running Media Composer is actually more powerful than maybe the workstation they have under their desk, for example. Um, and so overall, we've had very positive feedback across the board in terms of the overall experience uh, for edit on demand. And it's certainly being used in a wide variety of discussions. Now we have uh, uh, been fortunate enough to have a variety of different speakers talk in the past about uh, different types of productions that are happening inside of Edit On Demand. And so that's what I wanna talk to both John and Chris about today. So uh, so John, can you just talk a little bit more about your company, sort of the company size? Uh, I know you mentioned some of the productions that you guys already work on, but, but just talk about some of your environment, you know, how it's set up, how many editors, you know, how many people are in the company, that type of stuff. Sure. Well, I guess it's sort of everything is uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic because right. um, at this point, even though we're around 30 to 35 people, depending on the breaks uh, or depending on the week, uh, we are now 100% remote. Uh, so we went remote. I think we had 12 editors on staff at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, our major client was a large streamer. So we deliver up to 20 original spots a day. Uh, with social and digital versions, we're delivering up to 250 distinct pieces of content a day, usually in the 30 to 60 minute or 30 to 60 second area. So we had to take all of that offline. Um, we were using a third party uh, shared storage solution and tried VPNing into it. Couldn't get it to work properly in a way that was efficient. Basically send everybody home with towers and uh, local storage. And it, it, it was a real challenge uh, even to service uh, our major clients. Um, so we tried a bunch of different remote services. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, we couldn't find anything that had a latency that would make the editors happy. So people would find that there would be a two or three frame lag and find that if you're cutting music, if you're cutting anything intensive, um, that there wasn't really a product on the market that would let us work as if we were still uh, in our home environment. Um, so I came to edit on demand. I was talking to my avid rep one day and trying to, we were just going to do a trial just to see uh, how the latency was with edit on demand. I had a client for a large financial company come to me and say, well, we need six hours of content created in the next four weeks. Uh, we're shooting on four continents and um, yeah, it all has to be delivered on four weeks. And I thought, geez, even, even if I were back in the office, it would be difficult to staff up for this and to do this properly. So we engaged with Edit On Demand. Um, we started, I think, with five seats. At one point we went up to six or seven seats. Uh, the great thing about it was we were able to work um, across four continents across all the different time zones, as if we were literally sitting in our office. We found no difference at all. We had brand new HP workstations. We found the speed to be incredible. Uh, the file transfer speed of getting stuff ingested, especially since we're working with a bunch of different formats coming from you know, Asia, Europe, uh, and uh, both sides of the United States, uh, we needed a fast and reliable way to get stuff up. 
uh, at all hours of the day. Uh, File Catalyst was a great solution for us uh, for that. Uh, and the other great thing was, is because we can add seats whenever we wanted to, creative directors who weren't necessarily editors, we were able to get them to log onto the system and review stuff in real time because, um, you know, they can just log on and look at the sequence. And when you're talking about reviewing an hour long sequence and especially multiple hour long sequences, it was really, a, it was a great experience because again, nobody's local. Um, the second project that we engaged on is um, uh, for a prestige streamer who is launching a major new show in January. And I think they needed 50 pieces of content between uh, two minutes and 10 minutes. And again, it's sort of a tight turnaround for that kind of thing. We're currently running 20 terabytes of uh, storage on edit on demand, which is fantastic. We started with 12 and we needed more. We just added more. We started with four seats. We're up to six. We run them around the clock. Um, and it's uh, it's a great way to expand your service. And um, realistically, with those two large projects, I can't think of any other way we could have done them. That's amazing. Uh, Chris, how about you? What was life uh, like before EOD? And then uh, and then sort of how did you come, come to find EOD? Well, I I guess I, I kind of had the benefit of being able to um, start fresh on this. Um, so I uh, was post supervising a, uh, a low a tier one low budget feature, um, and we're looking for a remote solution that would fit within our budget. Um, I had been exploring a lot of different premier based um, uh, cloud services, um, but you know the the editors that we were going to use, um, you know, we're, we're primarily avid. So we had to kind of mm -hmm. switch gears. Um, and of course we looked at systems like the traditional, um, you know, jump desktop or, or Teradici into a, a, a local system at a facility. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, but those costs were as much, if not more as just renting a bay there on the, in, in the physical yeah. space. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, you know, I had to had to sort of switch gears and see what what other solutions were out there for remote work, um, and came upon the Avid Edit on Demand system, and contacted um, uh, Carson Endel at Melrose Mac, who I've worked with on you know a bunch of different projects, mm -hmm. uh, and so he he got me in touch with the Avid team and got got us set up here, um, and it was it was really great. You know, our our editors uh, worked pretty much seamlessly it was almost as if they um you know they really didn't need any kind of setup at all um it was such a smooth transition for them um and yeah i, I you know i i don't regret the the decision for a second that's great and you have uh folks are they all located somewhat within proximity to you like in the area or are they really yeah so our our editorial staff for this um they were both located in, here in town in la so um yep. you know at least we were able to work off one single data center um the production was shooting in vegas so you know transfers up to uh up to that west two uh data center were, were pretty smooth um you know obviously there are issues on the the local isp end um but yeah i mean it was it was such an easy process for us so that's great so there you have it so you have chris who's doing a tier one uh film feature film and then you have john who's doing what sounds like a combination of corporate work and some social media oriented content um all being done on edit on demand so you have two very different use cases and you also have two very different sort of dynamics in terms of where people are located in proximity to the production itself uh, so, uh, as you can see, there's there's definitely some really uh, compelling arguments already in terms of why it on demand is a good fit. Um, so, John, if you uh, look at sort of uh, your experience so far, can you just describe, um, you know, sort of the experience of getting it set up and then once the editors had access to it, um, sort of the collaboration and, you know, sort of some of the uh, responsiveness and just the overall edit on demand experience itself uh, for your staff. Sure. Well, like Chris, we'd also looked at installing a local Teradigi system uh, on premises. And the biggest reason not to do it, uh, obviously, besides cost, was um, <clears throat> we would have had to need a tech on staff full time to basically yes. run that, make sure it didn't go down. Um, also, we wouldn't have had access to uh, the Nexus system, which is something that we've wanted to do for quite some time. So, this is a great way to get introduced to that and use it. Um, once you complete the initial setup, it's, it's really as simple as add it, sends you a link, you click on the link, 
and you follow the link and it installs the Terry DT system on, on your local machine. And your local machine, like I, I'm not editing with it, but I run it on a MacBook Air. We have people who are actually doing full up editing they're using um, uh, Mac minis because you're running on um, the systems at Avid. So like you can pretty much run it on anything. Mm -hmm. um, the editors have not noticed anything. And when we actually, we did a quick trial before we, we did the first um, implementation of it. And so we said, uh, who are the most annoying editors in the company? Who are the people who can install a font? And we'll have them, we'll install, have them install it first, see if they can do it. And if they can do it, then anybody can do it. And so we had the crankiest, ordinariest people we could find do it. And uh, we didn't really have any issues at all. The other great thing about it is that nothing goes wrong. It's like everything is a seamless experience. You can have any issue whatsoever, you have access to Avid support, um, which is definitely better than any support that I would install personally. Uh, so it's been a great advantage to us. But no, it's, and, a, it's a seamless experience. If, if you're running the latest Media Composer, um, nobody's got any issues at all. And uh, did you have any uh, folks in your staff who were, you know, cloud tech, tech savvy, if you will, right? People who were used to setting up VMs or, or any, any real cloud tech experience or, or was it, you know, and any concerns, by the way, in terms of when you heard about, okay, I don't know, the man runs in the cloud, do I need to have someone who is, you know, Azure uh, certified, if you will, from a technology perspective? Did you have any of those concerns? Uh, we definitely had those concerns because, you know, we tried to set up various VPN issues. And, and as I said, we'd spoken to Teradici uh, specifically, and uh, the, the barrier to entry there was high. Um, and definitely I would have wanted somebody on staff who could have done that. We don't have anybody on staff who's got any familiarity with it at all. Everybody is just a basic media composer end user um, and it works fine. That's great. Chris, how about you? What was your experience like? I mean, in terms of like, you know, set up uh, and then once you got up and running, just overall responsiveness and, and overall usage. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, like John mentioned, um, our uh our the main editor was working off of a mac mini um doing this cut because you know essentially you're just streaming the desktop of the of the system in the cloud um yeah. so i since i had already set up the system on my computer at home um i did the same thing on hers took it over to her house got it up and running plugged in all three monitors you know a third one for the client monitor and she was up and running immediately. Um, our assistant editor had to go back to a previous version of Teradici because he was on an older uh, Mac OS um, version. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, besides that, you know, and, and Kent can attest to this because he he helped us out on on that little um, that small issue. Uh, it was such an easy fix and took 15 minutes, and you know, boom, they were working. And then in terms of getting the content, right, did you did you bring content in, transcode, and then upload? Is that pretty much what you did, Chris? Um, for us, our DIT was doing the transcodes for edit proxies and web proxies on okay. set. Um, so he was really, he was essentially just uploading directly to our Avid Media Files folder um, with, an a, with an ALE and boom, we were working. That's fantastic. Yeah. John, how about you for your content? Your content is probably a little bit lower bit rate, right? Maybe uh, at least for the maybe for the social media stuff. I'm not sure, but but can you describe you know no. what your process was? Well, so all of our stuff is like so we deliver stuff for social, but we cut for broadcast first. So everything we got, got is 4K. Uh, we're streaming AMAs at 4K and having a fine time. Yeah, excellent, excellent. That's great. Okay, so now that you guys are uh, sort of in the thick of of uh, of using edit on demand. Uh, Chris, for you, what does this what does this make you think in terms of like going forward in terms of you know just the cloud in general and and you know how is that formulating uh, your future direction right as a as both a, a, a you know someone who who's deep in production and sort of what you're thinking right what are the possibilities going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think for for shows where the um, the creatives don't need to be in the same room with the editorial staff, um, you know, directors, producers, whatever. Um, I think there's almost no reason not to go with a system like this. Um, when you factor in the cost, um, the uh, general uh, <laughs> quality of life for the for the people for the people doing the editing, not having to leave their house and sit in traffic, which you know, obviously in in LA. You, <laughs> It's, it's kind of a big topic of conversation. Um, 
you know, it's, it's such a great way to do it, especially without having to make the kind of investments in, in for physical in infrastructure that you would with building out a facility. Um, you know, there, I'm sure there will be instances where your director wants to be in the same room as your editor, and, but they could do that at their house, or they could do it from a facility where they can connect in, um, you know, via hard line. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it, it'll be a, a solution that I'll, I'll definitely champion going forward. The, uh, it's an interesting point too, like the traffic. I mean, that isn't a small uh, thing to consider, right? Because it has a bunch of different ramifications, certainly quality of life, right? That someone can be home, like you said, and, and edit, you know, when it's convenient for them to a certain extent, right? Obviously they have to get their job done, but you know, you could maybe start at 11, edit, and then, you know, go pick up your kids at school, come back, so on and so forth, whatever the case may be. There's also environmental impacts to that too, right? There's less people driving cars, hopefully, as a net result of uh, of this experience, right? And I know that even just looking at some of the avid forums on Facebook, right, when this first started and people started editing from home and whether they were doing, you know, remote access to on-prem resources or a cloud uh, service like Edit On Demand, um, one of the things they mentioned was that uh, this should be game-changing for the industry, right? Uh, I was just actually in New York City at the uh, News Tech Forum, and uh, it's interesting to see that the sort of dichotomy in approaches going forward for news versus post, right? In news, they seem to be uh, bringing more people back, you know, to the office, if you will, while at the same time, you know, keeping some resources like journalists and videographers and whatnot out in the field. Obviously, a different workflow, but but still interesting to see how, uh, you know, in Hollywood uh, and how they're sort of more embracing I guess a more distributed workforce, whereas, you know, in some other verticals within our vertical, um, you know, they're bringing more people back while at the same time uh, still benefiting significantly from sort of the changes that were brought on and accelerated really uh, by the pandemic. So, John, how about you for, for you in terms of uh, some of those aspects of it, in terms of like the accessibility of it, uh, the fact that people can work from home, um, you know, how has that sort of changed some of your uh, go forward thinking just operationally, right? Uh, well, certainly it's given us access to a much larger talent pool uh, than we ever had before. Um, yeah, great one, of the things, one of the things we had said to people at the beginning of the pandemic was, you know, just go and find yourself a place to live, you know, because you might as well live where you want instead of in your small queen's apartment. But um, <laughs> right. so our recruiting efforts are now, um, now we recruit nationally, which is great because we couldn't do that really before. Um, so it's been great to have that ability in addition to everything else that you said. Um, but again, I think that the system is sufficiently rock solid. Um, you know, and don't forget, in, in, in what we do, the primary reason why we use Avid is because you can be massively collaborative on Avid. So we will have six or eight or 10 editors working on the same project at the same time, um, pretty much all the time. And um, to be able to do that without any lag, without feeling as if, without feeling as if we're not in the office is really fantastic. Yeah. And then as far as as far as live edits go, um, I forget what it's called, um, but we have two guys that do it all the time. That there, there is something in Avid where you can live stream out of it. I can't remember what it's called, uh, but we had somebody doing it over the weekend for a, for a Rush project. So, um, you know, even some of those solutions or those problems can be solved within this environment. And that's a good point. I mean, you can certainly do uh, some NDI. There's, uh, you know, certainly one of the big requests is uh, over the shoulder monitoring, right? Being able to uh, access the output of Media Composer. And so we did announce uh, earlier in the year the ability of, of having SRT come out and that's coming out soon in regular Media Composer, not EOD just yet. Um, but there is the NDI output, right? And so you can actually do NDI out to say like a, a Zoom room, for example. Um, and we've, we've had definitely people using using that as an offering, but that, those are some of the good points, right? And that kind of leads me to my next question is as you're using Edit On Demand now and you have uh, your staff using it, what are, what are some of the things you'd like to see uh, going forward in terms of, uh, you know, other uh, additions, right? More tiers of storage or asset management, or are there anything, is there anything that jumps out at you that you'd like to see through the service? Chris, why don't you go first? Uh, am I still muted? Uh, no, nope, you're I, good. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, my biggest uh, feature request would be, um, and I, I know that, that there's there's been discussion about it, but um, a hybrid on-prem um, cloud-based system, um, just so that the, you have the option to work work locally, yeah. uh, particularly if you're cutting full res 
um, and you need to be able to do color and your monitoring and everything in in um, in the room. Um, you know that would that would kind of be my big feature request. Good one, John. How about you? I would say the only request that we have, and Abbott has been great about uh, helping us with this, is. Um, you know, whenever you start a project, you're going to need your plugins, uh, things that you would need admin access for, which obviously when you're running something uh, with multiple users, like edit on demand, you don't want somebody getting in there and screwing stuff up. So um, just, you know, just, I guess, an, an inception process where you install the stuff that you need to install so you can do it under the aegis of uh, Avid Tech so you don't screw anything up, but then also your editors don't come crying in a, in a couple of weeks saying, oh, I don't have this plugin. Um, you know, one other thing I did want to mention, though, is that um, one thing Avid did help us out with was uh, installing a spare, which we use for one client, mostly for the file transfers. The mm -hmm. great thing about working with Edit On Demand is that um, you're working with, you're not working with your local ISP. If you're doing that kind of transfer, you're working with um, Avid's ISP, which is very nice and fast. So it does <laughs> of those transfers. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so as you, uh, as you start to think about, uh, you know, Going forward, do you ever see uh, a time when you would go back to say purchasing equipment, you know, putting it into a, a an on-prem facility and, and sort of having that model still, or do you think that you know the cloud for you, John, for example, is that the way you're going to continue going forward in terms of uh, really using cloud and virtualized environments for for production? Yeah, I mean, I would say that right now uh, the cloud is probably about twenty percent of what we're doing. We're definitely mm -hmm. a solution to migrate things over, and as as Chris said. Um, a hybrid solution would be fantastic. And we are talking to Avid um, about what possibilities are there. Um, but I think that ultimately I'd like to see, I, I, I'd like to see a shift to 20% local and 80% cloud. Yep. Um, I think it'd be a, nice, it'd be a nice solution, but no, I'm getting the experiences that we've had and given that they've all been extremely time sensitive with massive amounts of data and large amounts of deliverables, I can't think of any the system has performed flawlessly for us. Chris, how about you? How does this uh, sort of, you know, form your thinking as it relates to on-prem versus cloud? I know you mentioned the hybrid as a feature request, but uh, any other thoughts uh, going forward? Yeah, I mean, like like John said, uh, I think a, an 80-20 remote or uh, cloud to, to on-prem system would really be kind of that sweet spot. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's... So far, it's been working out great. That's great. The uh, the thing that we found too with uh, with folks who use Edit On Demand is uh, they may start with one project, um, and the experience is so uh, beneficial and good that they quickly start spinning up other projects. Right. So it's giving them that ability to add capacity very quickly and really you know spike when when needed, uh, and basically take on potentially even more projects as a net result. Right. As opposed to Sort of the older ways, pre pre you know cloud options when it came to editorial, where you'd have to actually either rent or 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 even buy gear right and implement it in your studio if you wanted to go ahead and add capacity like that. Um, and so it's it's definitely one of those things. The other key thing you know that has been interesting throughout the course of this uh, not just the pandemic but just generally speaking, right when we're talking to people about cloud is security. Did you have any uh, say you know? Worries, John, or, or uh, you know, any thoughts before uh, going with Edit On Demand on the security front, and then how how are those uh, concerns alleviated? I guess as you as you learn more about EOD, uh, it was definitely a major concern for us on the second project that we spun up. Yep. Um, actually, yeah, I guess for the first one as well. Um, but you know, anybody who has to be MPAA client compliant, which is, I guess, most of us these days, um, yeah, it's, it's, a real, it's a real issue. Uh, and so before we engaged with the, the streamer that we're working with, um, you know, we had a conversation with them to make sure that, that they were fine with it and they were fine with it, which was great. Um, uh, every, every one of our users has a distinct login uh, and a distinct password. Um, you know, as administrator, I can change the passwords, but I don't know what any of the passwords are. Uh, so I'm very confident in the security of it. And uh, so are our clients. That's great. Chris, how about you when you were thinking about using it? Was there a, you know, security concerns for you and, and, and how did you overcome those? Um, I mean, it, it all seemed pretty locked down um, from, from where I was standing. Um, I, I know some of our producers um, 
still had questions about, you know, is the editor going to take a, a screenshot with their phone camera? Um, and at a certain point, you you just kind of have to trust the people that you're hiring or, or don't hire them. Right, um, right. But I mean, as far as getting media in and out of the system, um, it's it's really easy to uh, administer those permissions. And, um, you know, I, I was very comfortable with it from the get go. Yeah, we only, we only have one person who we task with uh, loading in and out of the system in order to mitigate some of those problems. That's great. And so, and John made a good point. I just want to make sure you to sort of emphasize is the ability within EOD to create the users, the accounts, right? And then the users can go back in and change their passwords, right? And so, and so of course, security is one of those things, right? It's going to always be uh, something that is, uh, you know, something we constantly iterate on because there are always constantly threats. But, um, but just generally speaking, you know, we have uh, passed some pretty significant tests, just generally speaking with the environment, right? Uh, for some of the larger media companies, and that is certainly benefiting the service as a whole. Right, the fact that we had to jump through as many hoops as we did early on in the process um, uh, for some of the bigger media companies, right, that certainly has, I think, benefited. Just generally speaking, the, the service, and then of course the fact that it's running on Azure um, and and all of the security that gets baked into the Azure platform, again, is also uh, a huge benefit to the service itself. Uh, so security, uh, like we all know, is always a moving target, but definitely something that. Uh, we have spent a considerable amount of time uh, building into the service itself. All right, so uh, I guess the, the 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 big question is, uh, John, as you as you go forward um, and you start to uh, sort of take on other productions, um, what do you what do you think uh, you know the future holds in terms of uh, expanding uh, you know the company, given the ability to now take on potentially more more projects? Do do you see that as a on the economic side of things, right? As a as a, another benefit for you and your company. Oh, surely. I mean, I think you know when you've got a when you've got a physical layout that you can't expand easily. And we were sort of a capacity before the the pandemic hit. So, um, yeah, for us, we'd be renting systems and stuffing people in corners. And um, I don't think that the rental experience is any more economical than the added on demand experience. So, the ability to instantly spin people up, to instantly be able to get access to storage. Um, pretty much on a next day basis is um, incredibly beneficial to us. As I mentioned, the first time that we used it, there is no way I could have taken on that job without um, having access to it on demand. And the one that we're, the, the large one we're currently using it for now, it's, it's sort of the same way. So I think that, you know, with the, with the legacy infrastructure that I have, we will hang out, we'll hang on to that and use it. But going forward, we're going to try to progressively link everything more and more cloud-based. Excellent. Chris, how about you? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, from a, from a business perspective, right? Some of the benefits you're seeing by using a cloud service like Edit On Demand. Well, yeah, I mean, not having to go out and purchase sy edit systems or, or even do the rental where you're fa having to factor in um, uh, the physical space. Um, is just such a no-brainer for me. Yep. Yep. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start uh, pulling some of the questions that people are asking. It looks like folks are asking some good ones here. Yeah. So, so Ray, I've, I've sort of compiled for you. There's, there's three themes, um, two of which I think the uh, panelists can probably address, but one is just basically about bandwidth. Um, and I think Kent has answered that you, you need a minimum of 25 uh, megabits for for uh, your screens and then uh, hopefully a latency no uh, higher than 60 milliseconds but I guess the real question is have you had editors editing from home on their home you know internet and how has that been Good yeah question. I mean we have people who have um, 50 megabits and, and like I said Mac minis and it works just fine yeah I think ours was around 100 maybe 150 and they never had any issues with lag. That's great. So you didn't have to upgrade anybody uh, in terms of their local internet connection or ISP? No. Not as far as like this. No. And in fact, I pulled back some of our HP towers just because I was like, eh, you don't need this tower to run this. So we just them cheaper stuff. All right, and then- um, The next question that came up a couple of times was, um, um, having multiple stakeholders wanting to have multiple people review something. Have you had, did you, uh, John and Chris, run into scenarios where you had 
maybe more than one producer that wanted to watch something simultaneously and, and can you do that and how did you do that? You go ahead, John. Um, yeah, so I, um, we've been doing that by having the producers log into uh, to their own edit station. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think we were using the NDI uh, solution within Avid the other day. Um, we don't use that quite so often, um, but currently what we do is we just have something log into their own separate workstation and present from the from the bin. But you know, with anything with Avid, it's massively collaborative, so it's not hard to spin these things up and get people into the system. Yeah, we didn't. That didn't really come up for us. But yeah. Um. Okay, great. And then Ray, I think the last question is for you. There's multiple people that are asking for pricing <laughs> and where they can find it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what I would say is, um, you know, you want to reach out to your your uh, your local uh, rep, right, to get pricing information. We generally don't share uh, pricing information publicly, but I know just from listening to both Chris and John, I mean. You know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, just the pricing itself, right? Do you guys find it to be, uh, you know, not only palatable, but but uh, economically friendly for you guys? I mean, I would say, like I said, we're a medium-sized company and the price never factored into our decision about it because it's 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 pretty, it's, it's it, it, I think it's pretty fairly priced. How about you, Chris? It was, it, it was a little more than half of what it was going to cost us to rent bays in a in a physical space for the same duration of time. That's a great that's a great uh, comparison. Thanks, Chris. All right, Corey. Any other ones? Uh, I think you already sort of addressed this, but there are questions about having a an on prem setup and and um, mixing and matching with edit on demand. Yeah, so what we found is that, uh, you know, people are basically downloading the project and bins and all the associated master clips and sub clips and sequences and so on. And they use that to basically point at the high res uh, sitting on a local nexus if they have one uh, or on a, a local drive. Um, and that's generally speaking what we found in terms of the workflow so that uh, folks can, you know, edit uh, in edit on demand. And then if they do have finished work that they want to do locally, they can do that. Um, they don't have to download all the uh, the media uh, by the way that they upload. So typically they they can upload it and uh, and work at a lower bit bit rate, lower resolution, and then they download the the resulting project in and media. Uh, uh, sorry, the pointers to the media, and then basically point it back to the high res locally, and then they do their finished work if that's required. Um, that's generally speaking how folks have dealt with it today. There are things that are going to come out I think next year that will will make that an even more seamless um, process. Um, and uh, I can't really talk to much of that just yet today, but uh, in early 2022, I think you'll you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised by some of the things that are coming next year that will further make that an even more seamless uh, solution and even address some of the requests that uh, Chris made as it relates to, you know, sort of that ability to work uh, between on-prem and, and, uh, and in-on-demand. Uh, someone had a specific question for Chris about what Chris's tier one budget was. Uh, the, the feature, uh, about 6 million. Excellent. And then someone was asking if the studios approve this system. I'm not sure that that's. And I think you have, to, you have to speak to your individual client about it, but um, I haven't had any problems. Yeah, ours is being independently uh, distributed, so that wasn't wasn't really an issue for us. And then uh, for customers in Europe, I'm just asking, uh, 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 is EOD as readily available for uh, folks in Europe as it is here in the Americas? Yes, great question. So EOD is available in multiple regions. And in fact, I probably should have put that slide up, but um, really the, the sort of uh, deciding factor as to the deployment of EOD in a Microsoft data center is really around a GPU enabled VM um, that meets the spec to, to run Media Composer. And so uh, Microsoft has continually added more and more uh, VM enabled via, uh, systems to multiple data centers around the world. So yes, you can deploy it in multiple places in certainly in Europe, the US, um, Australia, APAC, there, there are a variety of different 
uh, areas that are covered. Um, and so uh, as Microsoft adds more of those, uh, you know, GPU enabled VMs and different data centers, we definitely take advantage of that and you can launch the service there. Um, what I'll do is when we send an email out to the group uh, with the recording, I will make sure that we include all the regions the service is currently available in. So you have the complete list. What a great question. Um, and then a couple of questions about support. One for, was well, someone was asking if you had any major downtime during your experience. And then another person is asking, where is the support for EOD based? Our support um, team is in, based in the Philippines, but I'm not sure that that's, those are the folks that are doing the support. I don't know if you know, Ray. Uh, yeah, so most of the support folks who deal with EOD are uh, US based as far as I know anyway today. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I would just leave it at that in terms of just the resources that are out there that support uh, EOD today. And John or Chris, did you did you either of you have any situations where you did have a lot of downtime for any reason? No. No. I think at one point there was a one machine that needed a hard reboot and it was done within 15 minutes. Um, so that's out of running 12 total for three months, four months. Yeah, we never we never really had any downtime to speak of. I mean, a, you know, a couple of random media composer crashes, but um, nothing that that you get that you, or that you wouldn't get on a local machine yeah and the edit on demand team has been very responsive yes that i can confirm that's great and that's great to hear good question and then another question just popped up related to this is probably a good one media composer versions do you have to run the latest version and does it does that always get updated for you um but, and then, I mean, Ray, you can jump in as well, but but basically, no, you're not, um, we don't limit. We have a, a variety, I think, of versions of Media Composer that you can run. We, I'm not sure if we're still offering even a 2018 version, but- um, Yeah, we're not. We certainly are, yeah, oh, okay. So we're certainly not um, uh, updating it behind the scenes while you're using the systems. You know, when, when it gets installed, there's a version that's installed and that's it. We're not gonna constantly update it. Yeah, generally speaking, the way it works is Media Composer will put out a release and then uh, the EOD team will then go ahead and qualify that release for use in, in EOD as the service. Um, and as Corey points out, there's usually a couple of uh, different options there. Um, but for example, like the, I think it was the 2018-12 release, which was kind of the older UI, that had gotten retired, partly because again, these are, long, these are considered long-term releases, right? And they support them for as long as they can. Uh, they being a, us, Avid, <laughs> um, and and uh, and long story short, if you have you know so many releases out there, it just becomes challenging to support, uh, certainly, certainly longer term ones. So that's generally speaking how they how they do it is they they take the the more recent releases and then they try to qualify it so that in the next iteration of EOD um, that is an option for you. But uh, like Corey says, we're not updating anything while you're using it uh, behind the scenes. And then a quick related follow up question. Wondering what specific version were uh, John or Chris running uh, during their um, right now? No, oh, good question. Oh, I'd have to look, but we just generally install whatever the latest release is. Tell them to suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were. Uh, we started on uh, twenty twenty one point two, and then went to 21, 2021.9. Yep. So new UI, uh, which is good. And then uh, I see this question on when the project finishes, what's your backup cleanup suggestion? So there are egress fees. So backing up locally could get expensive. So I don't know, Kent, if you want to just answer that one for the, for the crowd or? Um, yeah, I can answer it. Uh, yeah, basically, I guess it's really up to the individual. Um, as most of the time you're putting up proxies up to the cloud, they're obviously originating from high-res media, which you already have backed up on-prem. So typically you'll have those backed up as well as at the final, either you know you can bring down your project, just a project data basically to relink to other masters um, or the bin or whatever the project is. If you happen to, and this is obviously dependent on the individuals and what you're looking to bring down, you can all, always do a consolidate of this sequence and bring down that proxy Yep. media as well as the project if you really felt that you needed that yep that's a good point 
John, for for project, you guys, if you guys you guys have finished a project in the EOD, and and if so, did you download the media, or did you just basically spin it down when you were done? Um, I just kept a local copy on our uh, in-house uh, system as we were loading it up, so we always had two copies just in case, and backed up the project every day. Um, the nice thing is, um, when we were doing our backup project or backed up process, uh, we had missed a few a few files that was after our term had completed uh, with Avid Edit On Demand, and um, it was no problem. Um, we just called Avid, uh, they restored the drive, we grabbed a couple files we needed, and that was into that. All right, perfect. Um, I see someone mentioned that they only edit on a Mac, so there. So that's fine. You can you can use a Mac and and uh, certainly uh, use Stereo ET running on a Mac and access uh, the systems running in Azure. So that is uh, not an issue. There are a couple other sort of roadmap questions, Ray, about uh, seeing Pro Tools and EOD, um, and then I think getting an, a Mac OS VM so that you're actually the VM. Is running the Mac OS. Gotcha. So good question. So uh, I have not seen any news coming out of Microsoft around a Mac OS uh, VM availability yet. I have seen one for other cloud service providers, but I have not seen one from Azure, but I can certainly find out um, and let you know. That's obviously a, a Microsoft thing that I have to think. Um, and then in terms of uh, Pro Tools, um, uh, I, I would say it's not on the roadmap that I've seen. It uh, doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. Uh, just uh, I have not seen it on a on a current roadmap. Um, it is a good question and it's a good request. We've definitely gotten that one before, um, but so far anyway, I have not seen that one uh, on a on a twenty twenty two roadmap anyway. And are there plans to support other cloud services like uh, Amazon Web Services? At this time, uh, I would say no. There isn't. We're we're trying to perfect the service running on uh, on Azure. So the, the, the prevailing thought is to expand what we have in EOD as a service um, and, uh, and basically make it so that it's really ubiquitous to you, the user, um, which I think you're hearing some of that from John and Chris, which is, you know, it, it's, a, it's just a deployment, right? It's, it's, a, it's basically a system running in a cloud somewhere and you're, and you're able to access it from anywhere. And the big thing that we're focused on is the experience, right? And that means not just editing, you know, using Media Composer and editing, right? That That's a given, right? That, that you should have a great experience doing that. But it's all the other things around it, right? Which have been alluded to by both Chris and John, which is, okay, I need to add some editors. I can quickly spin up more editors. I need to add more storage. I can quickly add more storage. I need more bandwidth. I add more bandwidth, right? So it's those kinds of things. Um, I need to manage my Nexus workspace. I'm using a very familiar, you know, tool, which is Nexus workspace, right? It's, it's the Nexus console um, that you're already familiar with. Uh, so the goal is to really try and make the experience around the service uh, even better while adding more options, given feedback from folks who have used the service to make it uh, more, more effective. Uh, so I would say that's more of the prevailing thought. Any other uh, good ones in there, Corey, that you see? There is a question about uh, HP's acquisition of Teradici, and does that have an impact on the future of EOD? Uh, no, that's a good question. Uh, we actually just met with um, HP, uh, I think it was just two days ago. Um, so no, that does not. Avid has a great relationship with HP, very longstanding relationship with both HP and HPE, for that matter. Um, and uh, no, the acquisition of Teradici by HP is uh, is not, uh, you know, a bad thing. In fact, it's uh, it's, it's going to be a good thing. And there are things that they're doing that will be, I think, also beneficial to users in 2022 and beyond. So, uh, no, it does not impact us negatively at all. If anything, it's a positive thing. Uh, and then someone's asking about file catalysts conforming to MPA content protection rules. I have no idea. Yeah, not sure on that one. I can, you know, what I'll do is uh, MBA content production. I will find out. I, I will find out. I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, and then hardware recommendations for editors working at home. Uh, so there are, so there is a uh, FAQ document that kind of gives you some ideas, but uh, in terms of like thin clients you can use from home. So uh, I will also include a link to that document so that you can see what's recommended. 
but as you can hear, again, it's not it's not anything terribly heavy, right? You have Mac Minis, right? You have uh, you have systems that are pretty thin, that are that are basically uh, using the Teradata client to access BD Closer running on the VM in, in Azure. So. Can you run a client monitor or just me to closer on the desktop? Not sure what that one means. I think they're asking whether or not we can have an external monitor attached to a system that's on prem. So, I mean, at your home, you have your laptop running Teradici basically, and then can you have an external monitor to monitor? You know gotcha. So, there are things. So, I would go back to, um, the uh, comment I made earlier about the soon to be availability of SRT, right? Which will allow you to sort of send SRT over commodity internet to really any SRT enabled player, uh, including decoders, set top boxes, free players of which there are many like VLC and so on. Um, and if you introduce a gateway in the middle there, you can send it to multiple people at the same time. Uh, and then there's the NDI option, which already works. Uh, which allows you to send it to, uh, say, a Zoom environment. Um, so we definitely know that there is a request there to sort of send the output of Media Composer in multiple different ways. So those are our uh, options are coming. Uh, on a related note, someone's asking about uh, the audio, the sound for the remote editor. Sound. So in terms of like how many channels or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a mixed to stereo, right? And that's all yeah. you're going to get on the on the remote client end. That's true. The um, the Teradici client is the uh, is basically a late enable or able to, I should say, deliver. Um, I think it was stereo at the time, but I do think in the upcoming releases there are uh, expansions to that on the audio side. That was definitely one of the bigger requests, um, and that is a Teradici thing. So yes, that that is coming soon. Uh, Mike Cavanaugh had a question about Avid considering allowing resellers to have their own Azure Tennessee to manage Avid tools in the cloud. Uh, that's a good question, uh, Mike. Um, I will I will get back to you on that one too. I think it is a good question. Um, we uh, we can definitely. I would say we just should take that one offline. But it's a good question. We'll definitely get back to you on that one. Uh, so then some questions about um, vulnerability to ransom, ransomware. Well, again, I think the, the benefit of EOD running in Azure is you're benefiting from all the security baked into Azure as a platform. Um, so I would say you're, you're probably better off in many ways, right? Uh, sitting on a security infrastructure provided by uh, Microsoft as opposed to, say, trying to incorporate your own or roll your own, as many would say. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a ton of benefit there, honestly, from a security perspective that uh, is already rolled into uh, EOD. And then EOD has gone through its own independent audit on several occasions uh, for security. Um, as always, right, there's always some risk to all this stuff, uh, but I would say you're better positioned sitting on an Azure stack than you are on something sitting in your own building these days. Uh, and I don't know if anyone has uh, comparative information, but someone's specifically asking about uh, diff how, what are the differences between Edit on Demand and something like Bebop or Remote Picture Labs. Uh, so the let's see. So uh, I, I honestly don't know enough about Bebop to to answer, other than to say that you know EOD is uh, a couple of things that I do know. One is you could spin it up in a matter of hours. Two, it does all the auto provisioning for you. Um, so you don't need to do anything other than, you know, once you get the email, you know, as John was saying, you basically uh, download the uh, TerraDG client, you tunnel in and away you go. Um, those are two of the bigger differences that I'm aware of anyway. Um, uh, and then, of course, just the availability of the service, uh, you know, versus, say, something like um, a, a sort of a reseller service, um, just the availability of it you know, all around the globe, uh, because we're obviously sitting in uh, Microsoft's Azure uh, data centers around the, around the world, right? Of which they have the most of any cloud service provider. Uh, 
Somebody actually asked the question, um, just based on a single project, whether what's the big difference between buying Media Composer Ultimate and Nexus Solution for Prem compared to EOD? And I think, Chris, at one point you kind of mentioned how much, based on a rental, it would have been, right? To do a rental, physical rental hardware opposed to, you know, doing the EOD. Where you said I think it was about half or something. I believe that was what you kind of threw out there. Oh, I think, think half, yeah. yeah, I think the big thing that people need to understand about EOD, and this is just based off a lot of the demonstrations that I do, is that it, it's not a price that you kind of look at at day one. So a lot of productions, right? You know you're going to have say 10 editors, and you're going to need approximately say 10 terabytes of storage. And typically, when you rent or buy, that's what you buy, right? And that's for the whole duration. Whereas EOD, the way you need to look at it is how much do I need week one, week two, week three, week four, week five kind of thing. And that's how you build the price on edit on demand. Because I can't remember if you mentioned it, Ray, but we do weekly as well as monthly for the yep. subscription for edit on demand. And so that's, that's what you're looking at is you're looking at what do I need? How many editors am I going to have on week one and how much storage do I actually need for week one? And that's how we typically deal, uh, talk to the customers and kind of go through their production cycle to determine what that total price is at the end, right? Opposed to a flat, this is what we're going to need. So I just kind of wanted to point that out. Yep. And and then just the fact that, you know, you don't have to set it up and, and manage it long-term either, right? Um, once you're done with it on demand as a service, you shut it off and you paid for what you paid for and that's that. And then you want to start another project, spin it up again, and away you go. Uh, Mike Cavanaugh is just noting that the, one of the biggest differences between Composer and Nexus is, uh, and added on demand, is that Bebop is solely for Adobe and VFX. Oh, yeah. Good one. Yep. Thanks, um, and then one final audio, just to clarify on the audio. So so the remote client, the person that's editing remotely is is going to be monitoring a stereo mix down of the audio. You can still work with, you know, um, multiple audio tracks that's still supported in your project, but from a monitoring standpoint, you're only going to be hearing a stereo mix. Yes, um, correct. Good, uh, good, good call out, Corey. Yes. Uh, and that also means that uh, you're unfortunately not going to be able to use any sort of external uh, control devices for audio because you're not uh, di actually directly be able to connect to the, to the media composer. As far as I know, I don't think that's supported. All right, we are two minutes from top of the hour. Um, I just wanna thank both John and Chris, as well as Kent and Corey for uh, being here today. Um, this has been fantastic, extremely informative. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, like I said, this is recorded. We will send out the recording to everybody. And then uh, I've taken note of the questions that we were unable to answer today, and I will definitely include those in the note that we send out. Um, I would encourage you to go and check out more information on the avid.com website and just go to edit on demand and you'll learn uh, even more information there. I would also encourage you to check out uh, both Kent and Corey have done past webinars uh, in terms of uh, deeper dives on the actual service and the editing experience and you know how to use it. Um, and those are up on uh, the avid channel up on YouTube. Uh, so please check those out, they're phenomenal. Um, and then there's just tons of content in YouTube, generally speaking about edit on demand, customer testimonials, um, and other examples, right? Uh, tips and tricks, educational material. Uh, so please uh, do that. And last but not least, thank you. Thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, there is a, a poll question coming up on your screen. So if you don't mind uh, answering that, that will help us improve uh, these webinars going forward. So if you don't mind uh, just taking a quick second to answer those two quick questions. And then last but not least, there is uh, two free versions of Media Composer uh, and one year subscription each that we will give out to uh, those who signed up for the webinar. So um, you will get an email, the winners will, uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting access to that. So Erica, who is uh, uh, our marketing person here managing the uh, webinar today, she will reach out to you and let you know if you won. Uh, once again, thanks again, John and Chris. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for being here today. Thanks, Kent. Thanks, Corey. Uh, happy holidays, everybody. I hope you have a, a safe one. Thanks again.